I'm Brandon, I'm Brandon Garrett here at Duke Law School. We're so thrilled to have Dustin Simonson here. Uh, Dustin has presented work with us virtually during pandemic times, but this is this is much, much better, and it's really exciting to celebrate Dustin's still, still new book, Radical Acts of Justice. There are copies outside that you can have signed. Uh, but uh, I have some questions that I can ask based on my well marked copy. Uh, the idea is Jocelyn, who comes to us from Brooklyn Law School, which is a professor of law, associate dean for research. Um, this book builds on um, years of really, really exciting work about movement lawyering in the criminal justice space. Um, the thought was that Jocelyn's going to tell us about why she wrote the book and, and give like a, a brief tour of it. Um, and then I'll see what questions you have. I have questions, but you should have questions. And so. Uh, I'll only ask questions if there's like a pause here and there. And that's our general plan for our hour together. Really looking forward to it. And thank you again for, for making the trip to visit us and spend time with, with us here at, at Duke Law. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to see you. Um, I am pretty familiar with the everyone sits on the side um, thing, but I'm going to try to do it so I can see you all. Um, so um, my book is called Radical Acts of Justice, How Ordinary People Are Dismantling Mass Incarceration. Um, and it has you know, the term mass incarceration in the title, um, although it wasn't my initial choice for the title. I could talk about that. If anyone wants to talk about title choosing. Um, but what I don't do in the book is spend a lot of time describing what mass incarceration is or why it's a problem. And I don't have this introductory chapter where I say there are 7 million people locked up at any one time in cages in different ways throughout the US, and here's why they're there, and here are the racial disparities, and here are the impacts on communities and all of us, and here are the problems with spending our resources on that. Instead of laying that out, and there are wonderful books that do do that, and law review articles. Um, <clears throat> this book jumps in to talking about how people are trying to push back against mass incarceration in their own backyards, communities, cities, counties, states, um, <clears throat> not necessarily through traditional political means, although they do that too, but by helping each other, by supporting people in collective ways, in ways that over time um, <clears throat> have something really profound to say about community safety, about justice, and ultimately, I think, show us why mass incarceration is a problem, by kind of living out other ways and understandings of being in community together, keeping people safe, um, and seeking out justice, or pushing back against a sense of injustice. Um, <clears throat> and so the book, uh, as Brandon said, follows um, about a decade of writing and thinking, and also being in solidarity with um, groups of people and social movements um, trying to push back against the carceral state and especially against criminalization. Uh, you know, the use of policing, prosecution, and punishment um, as a way of governing. Um, and so that, that what I've been following are certain kinds of tactics, like ways of helping people that are using the tools of the criminal system to help people, but by using those tools, actually fighting against the system. Um, and so uh, one of the main examples uh, in the book, and kind of the first uh, chapter laying out a tactic, is of community bail funds. Um, so raise your hand if you've heard of community bail funds. OK, so most but not all of you. Um, so a bail fund would be a group of people that get together, um, <clears throat> raise money, often from outside sources, or sometimes crowdsource from lots of different places, um, and then pay bail in criminal court for strangers. Um, and what I mean by that is, instead of money bail uh, traditionally being the thing that one might think, oh, somebody pays their own money to ensure that to, to promise that they'll come back to court, or uh, somebody pays money bail for a family member. This is a group that comes together and says, we might not know this person, but we are part of the community, and we're going to pay their bail because we feel safer if somebody is not in jail while their case is pending than if somebody's in jail. 
And not only that, we know that if we didn't pay bail, they would be sitting in jail uh, because they don't have the money to pay the bail. Um, and as a lot of you may know, there are well over 400,000 people at any one moment sitting in jails pre-trial before they've been convicted of anything, and most are there um, because bail has been set beyond the amount that they can afford. So when a community group comes in and uh, pays bail for somebody, and then does it again, and then does it again, and then does it again, um, in theory the money's gonna come back to them at some point when people come back to court, because they do come back to court. Um, but they're not just helping individual people, which they are, right? They're paying for freedom. Um, they're making a broader statement over time about a communal A view from people who are in the community of what safety is and what justice is. Um, to them, justice is not incarcerating people, usually for most bail funds ever, but especially free trial. And safety isn't coming from putting people in jail, but rather from getting people back home to their families, their jobs, taking care of their kids. Um, studies show that even two days uh, in jail through trial makes it more likely that someone's gonna be rearrested in the future. So also saying, we think this is a way to keep people safe from harm in different ways. And that statement over time becomes incredibly powerful. Um, and so in this book, um, you know, I've written law review articles, articles sort of saying, that's really powerful, sort of like I did just now. Um, but what I try to do in the book with community bail funds and with other tactics, I write about court watching, participatory defense, and people's budgets, or the other three main tactics I write about, is tell the stories of organizers and lawyer organizers um, <clears throat> who have done this work over the last eight to 10 years. So it's sort of an eight-year story, I'd say. And through telling those stories, try to show how this work of collective care and social solidarity actually is really disruptive um, and really challenges the system and the ideological foundations that criminal courts especially rest on. Um, because they claim to be spaces where justice uh, is working and where things are done in the name of the people. Um, when I was a public defender, I practiced uh, in the Bronx with Alison Korn, I'll have you know. Um, <clears throat> and there the prosecutors are the people of the state of New York, you know, and that's true in a lot of states. Um, but whether they're called that or not, the concept of criminal court is that communities and the public and the people are represented and kept safe by these prosecutions. Uh, criminal courts become these uh, formal spaces where that justice is meted out, um, and to the extent what happens there comes out into the public sphere, um, it's supposed to be keeping us all safe. And so something like a community bail fund um, is living out this alternative way of the people of the state of New York or the people of the, you know, the county of Durham or whatever it might be are taking collective action to try to pursue justice and safety in some way. Um, and so community bail funds, when I first started Writing about them in 2015, there were three active ones in the country. Um, and by 2020, uh, there were well over 100 bail funds in the National Bail Fund Network, and then a lot of groups uh, more informally uh, posting bail. And now there are probably, well, there are uh, between 90 and 100 active bail funds as part of the National Bail Fund Network. And so this is a tactic that's really expanded um, over the last eight years. Uh, court watching and participatory defense are also tactics that have expanded over that same period of time. Um, court watching would be a tactic where a group of people um, gets together and goes and sits to watch what's happening in criminal court. And here we're thinking not of a famous trial where there are already reporters there reporting on what happens. Because you can find in the news descriptions of things happening in criminal court. It's just usually uh, famous or notorious um, uh, people having different phases or often the trials in their criminal cases. And then sometimes we see the videos and we hear the reporting, etc. Court watchers are more likely to be in everyday courtrooms. Courtrooms that I know some of you um, have been in where things like bail hearings, arraignments, uh, adjournments are happening. Um, <clears throat> and these are rooms, um, I certainly was in a lot of them in practice, 
where multiple cases happen over a period of time, often in quick succession, and only sometimes with lawyers. Um, and they're public. There's a right to a public trial under the Sixth Amendment, and then there's also a First Amendment right for the public to be in criminal courtrooms, and all courtrooms. Um, and so court watchers are kind of exercising a constitutional right to be there, yet coming into a space where ordinarily there aren't people observing for the purpose of observing and holding accountable what they're seeing happen there. So court watchers might wear matching t-shirts and bring in clipboards and come sit three in a row and write down what they see. Um, and I've been there when they do that. Everything changes. Everything changes. Even though there are already members of the public in the courtroom, um, these are members of the public who have something going on that day. They have their own case, or maybe they're a caseworker, or maybe they have a family member who has a case. Maybe they're a complainant in the case. Whatever it might be, they're waiting for their thing to happen and watching what happens. And then probably from a fairly uh, disempowered or disenfranchised place as they sit there, right? They're relatively powerless in the courtroom. When three people come in with clipboards making clear that they're doing watching, they suddenly are the ones with power in the room, right? You can see prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, court officers kind of straighten up, notice that they're there, and shift how they're acting in some way. Or if they don't shift how they're acting, act kind of knowing they're being watched. Um, so for example, um, in New York City, uh, when Court Watch NYC uh, started a project where they would watch the Manhattan District Attorney, uh, it's the one before this one, his name is Cy Vance, um, he had made an announcement, um, I'm going to stop prosecuting certain kinds of turnstile building, like uh, getting onto the subway without paying. Usually it's actually not a turnstile, but that's often what it's called. Um, <clears throat> and so he made an announcement that he was going to do that, that he didn't want to um, criminalize poverty in that way, and that he was going to do something else. And also that he was not going to ask for bail in certain kinds of cases, so it's like a, a DA policy. And so the court watchers came, uh, and they sat, and they watched what happened, um, and they saw an ADA ask for bail in a kind of case where they said they weren't going to ask for bail. And so they went out into the hallway, you can't use your phone in the courtroom, and they tweeted about it. Uh, they had written down the name of the ADA, they had written down uh, the charge, and they had written down what she said. Um, and they tweeted about it. And you should have seen the reaction from the DA's office to having the public told, like the, everyone can go see it, what someone had just asked for in court. They were outraged. They asked for it to be taken down. It wasn't taken down because, again, it's something said in the public sphere and it's on the public record. Um, and then something even more um, fascinating happened, which is that a supervisor in the DA's office got onto Twitter and wrote a big, long explanation of why they asked for bail. Kind of beautiful, right? They were, I'm not sure it was entirely accurate, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> they, they were held to account, and they came on and said, all right, let's tweet and explain what we were doing. Uh, just so you know, we definitely don't do this in most cases. And there are the court watchers sitting there recording what they do, and they actually didn't find that they don't do it in most cases. Uh, but one example about what court watchers do is they're holding people in the courtroom accountable in the moment in a way that they're really not used to. Another thing that they do is over time, they might have a discrete project where they record what they're seeing and then write a report about it. Often in criminal courthouses where the system itself is not releasing data about what happens in the courthouse. Um, and when they do that, they find that watching changes what happens, and they also find that the things that they see um, are not necessarily what the different parties, um, including, by the way, uh, public defenders, say that they're doing. Um, in Philadelphia, for example, um, uh, one of the bail funds in Philadelphia teamed up with another organization, the Fund for Modern Courts, um, and they did something called Bail Watch. They went to watch bail hearings um, kind of in the basement of this courthouse um, in Philadelphia. And they did it uh, for a 24-hour period. They had bail hearings all night long in Philly. Um, <clears throat> and they recorded every single case. Um, and they wrote down things that happened, and they also were able to talk to people who bail was set by going to jail, getting their permission, and then getting some of their stories out there. So there are narratives involved. But one of the things they found is that when they scraped the data, which was available, although just like in complicated Excel format, 
that the 24-hour period that they watched had bail set at the lowest amount all year long. So the magistrate watching, or perhaps the DA is asking for bail, that this is a place where the DA has said he's not going to ask for bail, yet is asking for bail. Um, so whether it's the DAs or the judges, or maybe the defense attorneys are making long, powerful arguments in ways they wouldn't if they weren't being watched. Who knows, right? It could be all, it could be everybody. Um, but when people are being watched, they ask differently. And the actors in the system are not used to being watched. They're used to everything just going, uh, you know, again, and I know that there's lawyers in there on all the different sides, but lawyers get used to it too. I've been a public defender. You get used to the way that things work. And you get used to people not watching you. And so when people from the public come in and they sit in court, it shifts the dynamic in the courtroom, it shifts what happens, and it also builds community education and power. And what I found from talking to court watchers is not that by sitting there they said, wow, I feel like I really held the state accountable today, and so I'm feeling better. Instead, in debriefing sessions, uh, and this is in, for court watching groups in a dozen different places all around the country, so not just New York and Philly, um, in debriefing sessions, which court watching groups uh, always try to have, um, every single group uh, would sit around and sort of collectively think about how while they were sitting in those courtrooms, it didn't feel like justice. Like even when people started speaking and giving long speeches, um, and sometimes uh, the Philly court watchers would kind of giggle when they heard some of these speeches because they seemed so performative. They didn't feel like justice was happening or even could happen in these spaces. And so it actually became kind of radicalizing for people who joined these groups, not necessarily because they didn't believe in criminalization, but because they were maybe interested in seeing what happens in criminal court um, or interesting in doing a, getting pro bono hours or doing a volunteer project or whatever it might be. It sounded interesting. It's actually an incredibly radicalizing experience to sit in a criminal courtroom and watch person after person brought in in handcuffs and then often sent to jail. These acts that can be really quick, that can happen in 20 seconds. And then if you stop and think about it and give it the importance of sitting, and you know, it takes time, it can be boring. Sitting there for a long time, watching what happens and kind of bearing witness to the violence that's happening in the name of the community can be incredibly disruptive. The other uh, tactic in criminal courthouses that I write about is participatory defense. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Okay, so fewer. A participatory defense group um, would be a group of people that doesn't include lawyers, um, that meets regularly to talk about and fight for pending uh, legal cases, uh, often pending criminal cases. Uh, sometimes exclusively, exclusively pending criminal cases. And so, uh, for example, one of, the, one of the participatory defense hubs that I follow in the book is in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and they've been meeting um, for about six years now, every Monday night uh, in a church basement in Knoxville, except when they were virtual during lockdown. Um, and in those meetings, um, <clears throat> it can range from like six people to about 20 people, but they consistently had people there. Um, they, uh, somebody who has a pending case or a loved one with a pending case will talk about what's happening with the case. They'll look at the paperwork and they'll try to together parse through what's happening legally. Not bring in a lawyer to give the precise legal advice, but to work together to collectively to see if they can figure out what's happening and to develop uh, legal and communal knowledge about what's happening in the system at the same time that they fight the cases. And then uh, they <coughs> develop strategies to try to intervene in those cases. It might be sitting in court in support of somebody. Um, it might be uh, trying to uh, help track down evidence. Um, and one of the opening stories in the chapter about Knoxville involves the very first case they had where the hub tried to go talk to the public defender. The public defender wouldn't even let them in the office. Um, and then they pointed out uh, a place where they thought there might be a video. Eventually, the public defender investigator found the video and then exonerated the person. So sometimes it's about um, actually uh, exoneration through evidence. But more often, um, it's about uh, people trying to uh, contextualize this person who's being charged. Again, it's like the state, it's everybody, the community, the people against this one lone person. And here comes a hub that says, well, no, we're part of the community. 
often the slogan of participatory defense hubs involves the people, right? In California, they have uh, shirts that say, um, uh, uh, the people have the power, and this is where it's the people of the state of California. Um, and they're saying, no, this person is part of the community, and we're going to put together kind of an old school thing like a photo album um, that shows uh, this person like changing their kids' diapers, walking down the street to work, or sitting in a hub meeting, being a part of community. And we're going to remind the players in the courtroom that this is a person uh, and that if you incarcerate them or if you incarcerate them for longer, you're not just affecting that person, you're affecting all of us. And we are asking you to give a lower sentence for that reason. And again and again and again, hubs find um, <clears throat> that sentences are lower than they would otherwise have been. Um, how do we know this? Uh, one of the participatory dis uh, defense hub leaders who I spoke to in writing the book is named Raj Ayada. Um, and he, he's like a MacArthur genius winner for participatory defense hubs. It's not like I discovered him. Um, but he's been uh, someone I've been in community with since 2015 or so uh, because all of these tactics are aligned with each other. So in going to bail fund meetings, I would meet um, hub uh, members and I met Raj. And so when I was writing this book, he was really generous with his time and his interviews with me. And this is someone who's been doing participatory defense work for well over a decade. And this kind of organizing that led to the hub's formation for about two decades. And it was like our fourth interview. Um, he was a little bit late. Um, uh, this is on Zoom. And he, uh, a lot of my interviews with her on Zoom because we're right in 2020 when I was doing this work. And so Raj came in and he was like bouncing in his seat. And he's like a pretty chill, not bouncy guy. Um, and I was like, what's going on? And he had just come back from again, he's probably been to dozens if not hundreds of sentencing in his, in, his, in his time as a hub. And he was like, it happened again. And I was like, what happened? And it was this case of their hub member who also serves as their photographer. He's been a member who like does a lot of photography for them. So they think of him as their photographer. Um, he had a hearing, I believe it was actually a, like a probation violation. And they were trying to uh, um, put him in jail for violating what they said, for what they said was violating a condition um, of his release. And the hub had gone and talked to his public defender. Um, and the public defender um, had welcomed the hub in and in a really friendly, caring way said, I need you all to understand there is no way that the sentence here is not going to be incarceration, right? I know the judge, I know the law, I know the prosecutor, I know how things work, and I welcome your intervention, right? It wasn't a rejection of the hub, um, but I need you all to prepare for this. Um, and they said, thank you for your advice. And then they put together um, a video uh, talking about how incarceration would be unjust in the situation. It involved uh, the health of their hub member during the pandemic. It involved the fact that uh, this person was a photographer. Right? They talked about this thing that might not be seen as employment, but actually was like really intense community organizing participation. And Raj had just come back from the hearing, and he was uh, he was uh, he was sentenced to a non-incarceration. Um, he was stayed out. And he was like, it happened again, right? The system says that things aren't possible, and yet through organizing and collective intervention, things become possible. Um, and I mentioned that last story because that's kind of a theme through all of these tactics, that groups are coming in, they might have different motives, education, uh, freeing individuals, um, or just trying to learn about what's happening. Um, and over and over, part of the reason I think these tactics are growing, and the other two follow similar trajectories. Court watching groups, probably three or four in 2014. Now dozens and dozens uh, come to these national court watch meetings. Participatory defense hubs, the National Participatory Defense Network has really ballooned in the past six or seven years. So all three of these tactics are growing during the same eight year period, sometimes in community with each other, but often just in parallel, and finding that by going into the space of the criminal courthouse and using the laws available, right? It's not civil disobedience. They're saying we have a right to sit here, or the criminal procedure law says we can post bail, or the sentencing law says the public can speak at a sentencing, or somebody can put in uh, evidence as, as a sentencing. We're just going to follow the rules, but we're actually going to disrupt what's happening because the system isn't used to us being here. 
The system is used to prosecuting disenfranchised communities, communities of color, poor people, people who don't necessarily have the time, resources, and organizing capacity <coughs> to push back on what's happening. And these organizers often are from this communi these communities, but they're coming in with a collective spirit that's challenging this people of the state versus an individual. Right now it's like some people in the state and then the individual along with other people in other communities. And without the sense that the state is, the, is prosecuting on behalf of everybody, on behalf of the community, it can be hard to justify criminalization and punishment. And so for that reason, um, another big theme of the book is that uh, the criminal court system hates these tactics, really doesn't like them, really pushes back on them in ways that even when you know they're going to do that can be really startling. Like I have sat, and I do tell this, I have sat in a courtroom in the Bronx and seen a judge absolutely lose his mind because somebody walks into the courtroom free in street clothes. Even though they've come to court, they're on time, and they haven't done anything wrong. <coughs> lose his mind. Who said bail for this man? Right? This, the bail I said was supposed to keep him incarcerated. Who said bail for him? Um, and then that judge, Ralph Fabrizio, proceeded to do a series of hearings and shut down the bail fund. You know, it was really uh, absolute vendetta, but a vendetta that represents sort of the judicial response to bail funds more broadly. As I said, public defenders are often really frustrated by participatory defense funds for understandable reasons. It interferes with kind of um, the vibe they have going and the relationships they might have built with the system to try to help their clients. Um, and then court watching, as I said, you know, court officers are very often trying to kick court watchers out of the courtroom. <clears throat> they haven't really learned about the First Amendment because they haven't had to deal with uh, people coming in and trying to watch uh, who don't have cases on that day. So the system really bristles and doesn't like it, which shows the power of what, what's happening, um, but also can be scary. Um, when I, uh, I published the book um, at the end of last year, and I finished writing it before then, and I wrote in the book about repression of these tactics, but I actually didn't even imagine the kind of repression that has happened since the book was published, uh, especially of bail funds. Um, not only have some states just outlawed bail funds, uh, but there's actually a pending uh, uh, law in Georgia now that I do think will become law that says that nobody can post bail for more than three people, church, mom, group, whatever it is. Um, and if that's violated, it's a crime. So Georgia is literally going to say that it is a crime to free people. Um, and in some states, the way that it's written is if you're not related to somebody, you can't post bail. So just for community members to express collective care for somebody, even if you say, I'm going to help them get drug treatment, they can live with me, whatever it might be, uh, you can't do that. It's a crime. This collective care is such a threat to the system um, that we're passing laws saying that you can't do it. In Georgia, they're also prosecuting free people um, who have been running uh, bail funds that's been bailing out protesters with the Stop Cop City movement. There, they're calling it money laundering, uh, the, the raising of money that's just that's then paid for bail. Um, is felony la money laundering in both state and federal court. So they're facing decades in prison for operating a bail fund. Um, and so on the one hand, the state repression is like exciting because it shows the power. On the other hand, the repression is really escalating and really scary. And that's something that I've been thinking a lot about um, since the book was published. Um, really quickly, and then I'd love to hear what it is people want to talk about. Um, my plan with the book was to write about those three tactics. And uh, then in 2020, as I was talking to these groups, um, more and more people were joining in with coalitions that were engaging in local budget fights. Part of this was because, um, you know, defund the police was a slogan that was gaining some traction. Um, but that, in general, led to people thinking about their local budgets. Um, I think also because federal money was coming in for pandemic relief, and people were just noticing how budgeting and money can really help people in material ways um, that felt like it was keeping them safe. Um, and so increasingly, some of these same organizers were being a part of the generation of people's budgets, um, really vast documents that envisioned um, how money could be spent, and often 
focusing on this idea of safety, of defining safety. And so the, in LA, the people's budget involved actually hundreds of thousands of people. Um, <clears throat> and they created an entirely new category um, called, I think it was called reimagined community safety or redefined community safety. Um, because the community safety budget in LA was for uh, jails, cor uh, corrections, prosecution, and policing. And so the reimagined community safety went to non-carceral things. So it went to housing, uh, it went to food relief, and it went to health care. And the idea was that like, when they surveyed and talked to people and said, what makes you feel safe, those are the things that made you feel safe. And so I ended up having a chapter on budgets. Um, and like with all of these tactics, I should say, looking back to historical examples of people organizing around these things, um, in the 1960s, um, Bayard Rustin uh, and Asa Randolph um, uh, led the Freedom Budget for All Americans, in which they uh, tried to re-envision our federal spending um, and how to keep uh, people safe, including safe from harm, um, and not allocating any money to the criminal system, but instead thinking of other things. Um, so I mentioned that, just to sort of flag that if people want to talk about the history of this, we can. Um, and so I end the book, um, Talking about uh, myself and how I'm a part of these fights, I'm not, haven't just been a distance academic writing about these things. I've been in a lot of these rooms um, as a movement lawyer, as someone in, you know, helping out uh, bail funds, or as someone running a pro bono project at Brooklyn Law School in which people uh, were working with the bail fund in Brooklyn, um, whatever it might be. But I talk about my own. Uh, transformation uh, that kind of paralleled the one that a lot of organizers who I uh, write about uh, experienced, which is that through doing this work, I shifted from sitting there angry at a system that didn't feel like it was fair or just, um, and not always sitting there, right? As a lawyer, I was helping individuals. So working within a system that I had a really strong emotional feeling was not fair or just to uh, through being in community and solidarity with people who are helping people and pushing about uh, against the system, sort of emerging with a more helpful sense that there are other ways to live out safety and justice, that they're possible, not today, but that they're possible and happening. And there's this way forward that involves multiple ways of engaging, right? It, can, it involves being a public defender and being a lawyer. Uh, it can involve civil disobedience and disobeying the law. It can involve uh, political fights. I've um, been following a lot in Atlanta. Right now, they're trying to gather signatures for a referendum, like a fairly traditional democratic way of trying to have input into what's happening. It can involve electing different officials in the criminal process. But it can also involve these slow-moving, everyday ways of people taking care of each other uh, within the system uh, using the rules. And so part of what I wanted to do was just recognize that um, and talk about how transformative it can be. Great. Why don't we stop there for, for questions? Who wants to go first? Yes. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming and talking and your work. Um, my question, uh, in Massachusetts, a lot of where I was working in Massachusetts and based there, um, a lot of, like, PD is really grounded in a formerly incarcerated community. A lot of it, like, the folks both who, um, you know, hold participatory defense meetings each week, and then also, like, people who are formerly incarcerated, and then folks who benefited from, um, you know, folks showing up at their hearings, or, you know, were connected to PD or a bail fund as a service, um, then kind of get in, you know, get involved. Uh, and I was just wondering if you see in the, the places where you're looking at, how much is it, you know, what kind of involvement of formerly incarcerated folks um, do you see versus, you know, I mean, in, there's actually a little bit of a tension in Massachusetts sometimes with a bail fund that's um, kind of operated separately. Uh, I'm wondering, yeah. Um, so for, for, test, for just all of the tactics I write about are often organized by and led by people who um, identify as having been criminalized, whether they've uh, literally been incarcerated or not. 
Um, participatory defense hubs, it's true for that as much as anything else. Certainly uh, the Massachusetts hub, it's led by uh, women who have been formally incarcerated, um, which is uh, not necessarily the usual model. Um, but participatory defense hubs are led by and for people who have criminal cases and their loved ones. Um, so some of the national leaders in participatory defense work started out as moms in meetings, right? Um, and so they might not have been incarcerated themselves, but their kids are or were. And so they identify as directly impacted by the system. So if we broaden it out to that definition, um, then uh, participatory defense hubs are almost entirely led by directly impacted people in that way. And that's the idea behind them. Um, <clears throat> a bail fund, in contrast, runs the gamut, right? Um, I mean, as you, uh, I can tell you now, Mass I mean, the Massachusetts Bail Fund was founded by social workers um, who were not especially radical, um, except for maybe it's a radical thing to say, as a social worker who believes in well-being, seems to me that people being in jail because of their poverty doesn't uh, benefit well-being. Um, but I actually follow the Massachusetts Bail Fund in my book, um, and it has really shifted over time. Um, it now has the slogan, free them all, um, it's explicitly abolitionist, and it works every day in partnership both with the court watching group and with uh, the participatory defense hub. And the, one of the last stories in my book is about all of those groups working together in 2021 when Boston tried to start a, a jail court. Um, it was this really wild moment um, where um, there was an empty room in the local jail, and they were doing sweeps of homeless encampments. And they said, we have a great idea. Won't it be easier if we just have court in jail? Because then we'll already be there um, if they need to be incarcerated. And we have this free room. And so it's a jail cell, but they brought in an American flag. <laughs> and uh, they had prosecutors and defense attorneys in the room, and the judge uh, zoomed in. Um, and they did say, you know, Boston's a, not just a democratic city, like a fairly progressive city. You know, they said, we're doing this um, also as a form of help. We're going to offer treatment. We're going to try to search out uh, alternatives to incarceration when possible, because we recognize people who are houseless um, might need services. But we're going to do it in the jail. Um, and uh, they were really proud of this. The sheriff was especially proud of it. Um, <clears throat> and the DA, who, uh, you know, thought of herself as a progressive DA, now she's a U.S. attorney, was really proud of it too. Um, and the Participatory Defense Hub, the Bail Fund, the Court Watching Group, again, different groups, but it had developed enough to be in really solid community with each other. And then along with three other organizations in Boston that work on poverty-related issues, including houselessness, um, all of them got together and they said, hell no. They had called it, I think, like a homeless treatment court or something. And so they said, no, it's a jail court. Um, that's what they started calling it. That's what the press started calling it. They protested in front of it every day. They bailed people out. They did participatory defense for people who were in there. And the whole thing was essentially court watching. You weren't allowed to be in the room, but they had another room in the jail where you had to sit and watch the video, which somehow made you physically there. And so they uh, wrote about what was happening. And you know what happened? This court didn't last 30 days. Um, and the reason it didn't last is because these groups were saying, we're telling the world what was happening and showing the absurdity of it. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being, to the extent that like the sheriff and the actors had an interest in showing the system to be fair, or kind, legitimate, and just, it ended up backfiring on them. Because, um, of course, it depends from what view you're watching. Um, but it ended up looking like both inept and unjust. Um, and I know that's not exactly your question, but it's to say that like groups um, can be led by different people, and part of the stance involves solidarity with each other. And who you look for as the members, like who's speaking at that press conference? Um, it's going to be someone from a homeless encampment who's been criminalized, not a social worker who started a bill. Yes. Um, so you told. 
some stories I thought were really interesting about lawyers and judges being antagonistic to neutral about yeah. like people driven change. Um, were there any examples that you found or like particularly productive ways that lawyers could support and engage with the systems you talk about in the book? Yeah. Um, so it has been pointed out to me that I don't necessarily talk about it in the book as much as I might. But <laughs> here's one thing I will say. A lot of the people in the book who I write about as organizers are lawyers. They're just, if they're running a bail fund, they're running the bail fund not with a lawyer hat on, but with an organizer hat on. So there are lawyers throughout this book, um, including the leader of the Chicago Community Bond Fund. Um, the work of which led to actually abolishing money bond in the whole state of Illinois. And what's her job now? She works in the public defender's office, right? So she's a public defender at heart, but uh, ran the bond fund for a long time. So one way is to actually live out the practice, right? Um, but uh, yes, lawyers can be supportive in all kinds of ways. One is that they can um, you know, be, uh, whether you want to call it a community lawyer, a movement lawyer, a lawyer living in solidarity with these groups and giving them legal advice without centering, being centered in it, right? They could actually engage in the work without being the leaders of it. Um, and then I think this, uh, you know, the question comes up a lot, I think, with public defenders, is there are ways to uh, welcome in these groups and accept that there's always going to be attention. And the fact that a participatory defense hub like unearths tensions and inconsistencies in what's happening, including what's happening for lawyers, can be a good thing and could be something that you welcome. Like if you're representing someone and you really don't think it's in their interest to have this hub involved, have that fight. But don't be mad that the fight is happening. Because the fight is showing that there's something that doesn't make sense. Like why wouldn't it make sense? For a community group to talk about how wonderful this person is. How does that not make sense? That's not okay. And yet it might still be correct from the public defender's view, but this judge doesn't like that stuff. Um, that uh, Raj and others who write about participatory defense call that a productive tension. That if there's not a tension between the actors in the system and the people doing the organizing, that something's not right because then it's not it's not unveiling the ideology of the system for what it is. So being okay with tension, I think, too, is part of that. Um, so you said that a lot of these strategies have become more common in the last decade. Do you have a theory for why they've become a lot more common in the last decade specifically? Um, I don't have like a grand theory, but I could um, give some parts of what I think has happened. Um, one is just about the broader social movement energy of the last decade. So the years that I'm naming, 2015, 2014, that would be when the Black Lives Matter movement first emerged, or when uh, national attention started coming slightly more than before to issues of policing and criminalization and mass incarceration, right? The new Jim Crow, right, was written well before this time, but it only becomes a, best, a bestseller then, uh, a book about the war on drugs and race. Um, and so part of it, I think, is a political opening for broadly uh, organizing uh, in the criminal space, which really was not a welcome kind of organizing before this time. Um, people are looking back like at the work of like the ACLU and the NAAC Legal Defense Fund and being like, why was there not litigation around criminal issues until there was a social movement, you know? Um, so um, legal organizing space opened up. Along with that, funding opened up. So something like the bail fund actually relies on people donating to it. Um, and there was something about, you know, I remember the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, for example, um, when it started in 2016, um, unlike some other bail funds, it didn't have like a big grant. It went and tried to raise money. It raised a lot of money from like, tech bros, but it was still raising money um, and giving, on the one hand, this kind of interesting, oh, the money will come back and it's really rational, but talking about the criminalization of poverty in a way that resonated with people in a way that it wouldn't have resonated before there was this political opening. Um, so part of it is the political possibility, but I also do think there's something about these tactics and their relationships to each other 
that allowed them to swirl in power. Uh, you know, I went to 2017, a gathering of bail funds. Again, there were like less than 10. Um, Raj was there talking about participatory defense. Um, and uh, the Chicago Fund was talking about its court watching efforts. And so there was already a sense that these tactics were interrelated to each other in some ways. The other thing I'll say is that these are not the only tactics that have ballooned in the last 10 years. There are a lot of other ones, but they're the ones that I was close to and experiencing, and they are, I believe, the big ones that are in the space of the criminal courthouse. So I don't mean to say that they are on their own way, and I also don't mean to say that they're the answer to anything. Um, bail funds especially, some of them have started to close. The Brooklyn Community Bail Fund no longer posts bail in criminal court. They made an announcement that they don't want to become an arm of the system, a legitimate system, so they're going to move on to other tactics. Um, and pretty already in Indiana, and pretty soon else, pretty soon in Georgia, Kentucky, probably Tennessee, and probably Virginia, bail funds will be against the law. Um, and so, they're going to people are going to shift to other ways of organizing. Yes. Can you talk about what role you'd like law schools to maybe play in advancing some of these tactics? I don't want to name institutions, but there's one I'm familiar with that has been uh, very reluctant to have students, for instance, do things like court watching or PD because they don't want students to practice law when they're not authorized or um, you know get themselves in trouble when they're building a nice corporate career. So I'm just curious about what sort of vision you might have for, for law schools helping you the yeah. work you're describing? Um, I love the question. I work in a law school too, so I think about this. Um, you know, it's interesting that you made name court watching. I would think of court watching as being like the safe one. Mm -hmm. um, because you're just like, yeah, as being the safe one. But maybe it's not. Um, it depends on the court watching group. Um, so the practicing without a license thing, I do think one has to be careful about, but also you can be careful. Right. It's like being a legal observer or something. Um, <clears throat> the, I think the more interesting question is about the politics of it and what it means to take part in uh, social movement organizing as a law student or a future lawyer. I'm not even sure it's that different when you're a lawyer, right? So like, what does it mean to be a law student, or in a clinic, or a public defender, um, thinking about having individual clients or groups that you represent as a movement lawyer in your future or now, and then also have something else going on, right? I hope you all have something going on, whatever it is, right? You're going to the soup kitchen, whatever it is, like something in your community, in your world that you're engaged in. If we said, like, is it okay to go volunteer at your local soup kitchen, I hope we would agree yes. Um, and so, but what if, gosh, I hope you would agree, yes, but again, like, what if you live in a place where it can be a crime to give people food, right, which it is in some places, um, then suddenly uh, you are engaging either in civil disobedience or skirting the law, and then law schools should be telling you what the risks are and then letting you do it if you want to. Again, like, People are being prosecuted for this stuff, and I can't pretend they're not. Um, but if you are a law student or getting ready to get a law degree, then we are in places of great privilege, and so thinking about how to use that privilege. I also say that like, it also depends who you are, right? It depends on your race and your gender and whether uh, you can, whether a risk of arrest or a risk of whatever the, the thought is. Um, how it impacts you. So there's no right answer for everybody, but I think what law schools can do, especially in this political moment, and you know the specter of fascism, right? Do we name that? That's like a possibility. Um, well, then I think um, letting people decide for themselves where they fall into it. Yeah. Other questions? Hello. Thank you so much for this. Um, as a former movement lawyer from Philadelphia, I'm especially grateful to um, hear the shine and excited to read your book. And I just wondered um, if you have opinions about how some of these tactics can be adopted for the juvenile court context, where, of course, court watching is virtually impossible and, um, you know, participatory defense hubs are happening in Philadelphia juvenile court, but 
challenging and um, yeah, I guess just in general, if there's a, a format of any or all of these tactics that you see working in that very specific and limited space. Yeah, yeah, and I guess maybe one other answer to the why these tactics, I mean, one other thing would be like, why have they been rising in criminal court and not other places? And part of it is just, it has to do with the legal structures that make it more possible in criminal court. And the Sixth Amendment, which gives this public trial right, it combines with the First Amendment right to make open courtrooms a more powerful legal argument in criminal courts than elsewhere. Um, that said, every one of these tactics happens in different kinds of family court, juvenile court, um, abuse and neglect proceedings, whatever it might be, in different places, um, depending on the jurisdiction you're in. And I know there are fights here around this. Um, um, important fights and fights that I think, I mean, I'm also a First Amendment nerd. Um, and I think these are uh, tricky First Amendment cases because there's not necessarily a history of them being open. But there's another part of the First Amendment that says, what's the function of having an open courtroom? And here, the function of having an open courtroom, if nothing else, the court watching that's been rising in criminal courts shows us the power, importance, democratic potential, or democratic effect um, of having these things. Um, and yes, in Philly, there are more participatory defense hubs than anywhere else. And they're doing everything, immigration, housing, all the places. Um, so each of these tactics uh, is possible in each of these places. Um, bond funds are in immigration court a lot. Um, and people are thinking about collectively paying fees and fines in housing court in different kinds of places. So there's different ways of pooling money and resources to support people um, through larger mutual aid networks. So they're all possible. Um, but the legal structures make it really hard, especially in family court, which has this like veneer of protection that actually is exclusion. Um, that I know people are fighting against it, but part of the fight against it just has to be a collective fight and demonstrating that like, you know, actually here are all the families and they want to be in there and you're protecting them. What are we doing? Other questions? I was interested in, uh, oh, yes. Uh, going through the, you know, your interest in First Amendment law and in terms of, you know, the judgment that uh, money can be speech, what is the, like, legal basis of preventing people from paying for other people's bail? Yeah, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another uh, First Amendment belief I have, and we are going to see this play out in litigation in Georgia promise in the next couple of years, and it has already played on in Indiana. When a group gets together and pays money for somebody out of a larger belief that freedom lies on this part of safety and vice versa, how is that not speech? It is. It's speech, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in part you could say because money is speech that helps the argument. Um, but it also just goes back to like the, the when we're asking is conduct speech, you ask whether when looking at the conduct, can you tell that it's speech, right? So burning a flag, of course burning a flag isn't literally speech. And of course it's not always speech, but we're still going to say it counts as speech for that reason. Or at least, Supreme Court has said. Um, to me it's clear that when a bail fund, uh, partially because I'm sort of in the room with it, and so I know that it's intended as speech in addition to helping somebody. Um, and you can have you know, two functions and it still be speech. That said, there has been a case about this in the Seventh Circuit. Um, after uh, Indiana passed a law restricting bail funds, uh, the Bail Project, which is a national organization, challenged it and it got to the Seventh Circuit. And that's a two to one decision saying that it's not speech. Um, saying that uh, doing this, like when you go see someone pay bail at a window, you can't tell they're sending a political message. And the dissent says, this law would not have been passed if it wasn't a political message, right? So it's like, the dissent is like so short and sharp that you're just like, it's like a mic drop, but yeah, it's a dissent. Um, and so I think the dissent is correct. Um, I think it pretty strongly. Um, and the ACLU has said in Georgia that if when the law is passed, they'll be suing. So it's like a, a live issue, but to be clear, the one appellate federal court that's written about it has said it's not speech. Yes. Uh, I had another question kind of on the same 
topic. Um, if you follow the funding of the bail funds, do you find that it's mostly grassroots individual people donating, or is it coming from larger organizations that have that goal? And depending on your answer, does that change the analysis? If it's coming from a political organization that's right. kind of devoted to that purpose, does it change? Change the First Amendment, yeah. oh, interesting. Um, so first of all, the answer is like all of the above. Um, there was a really astounding moment in 2020 um, following uh, you know, the uprisings in Minnesota and around the country after the death of George Floyd, um, where tens of thousands of people donated to bail funds. Um, there was just a moment. The Minnesota Freedom Fund was at the heart of it. They were just, everyone was sitting at home under lockdown or they were on the streets protesting and they were giving small amounts of money, which led to millions and millions of dollars to bail funds around the country from small donations. Um, and there are a lot of bail funds that have started as like passing a hat in church, uh, leading to people hearing about bail funds leading to starting organizations. So there have been a lot of small donations, but also there are some very rich people who give money to bail funds. Um, some of them are celebrities who aren't very vocal about it, um, and some of them are um, to me, Mackenzie Scott. Like there's, you know, you can look in Mackenzie Scott's list of organizations and see that she uh, funds bail funds. Um, so it's a combination, and I think either way it's political, right? It's like fundraising for, a, if you look at, this is what's so wild about the, um, the money laundering charges. Like if you look at the Solidarity Fund, they say, we post bail for people because, no, 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 and then they're saying, haha, you said you were going to do that, and so it's money laundering. Like the donations are pretty explicitly, um, we're against the criminalization of poverty. Um, and you're helping people. And so it's like, yes. And here's, sorry, I, I'm, so, I'm so angry slash um, sure I'm correct. Um, <laughs> which is that the whole point is that helping people is political. That like when you collectively help somebody, that through that collective care and like freeing somebody with your time when you don't know them is a political. And so for the court either not to see it or pretend they don't see it, um, I think uh, either one of those sources of funding helps get there. Can they just start um, bail bonds agencies? But just, it, but just oh, they could. In Georgia, they, they, it's like you can't. Um, sorry, you won't be able to. Is it what well, you have to be a certified or something like that? There's some industry group that's And if you're those. charitable, you can't do it. Like, Georgia is just saying you can only do it if you're a a, a money making enterprise. Couldn't they just charge like very, very tiny fees or, or donate their money? Maybe. Donate I think, their I, 